Well, it's Thanksgiving week, you guys. Are you excited? Yeah. You know, turkeys went on sale, I think. I think. They're only down to $7 a pound now. So, um, yeah, it's been great. We did our Thanksgiving this week um, because my kids couldn't come next week for Thanksgiving. So we did our Thanksgiving this past week. In fact, my daughter and son-in-law and my two grandkids, some of you may have seen my granddaughter up here, Bethany. I don't know how Bethany ended up with her, but she ended up with her and, and she was singing up here. It's so great to have them. But it was like for us, this weekend has been sort of like the Griswolds uh, Christmas vacation. <laughs> Here's a little picture of our uh, family. This is in my driveway, and we had pop-up camper. We have a little tiny house, but it's been so much fun. It's just been like camping in Pop-Pop and Mimi's driveway. It's been so much fun, and so we're glad to have uh, the kids and their family here this week. Well, I started a new season. I started a new season. I started a new series last week called A Season of Thanks, and I talked about how, you know, it seems like at least in our culture, it seems like to me that we just jump from Halloween to Christmas and we kind of skip out on Thanksgiving. And yet, Thanksgiving is one of the most important virtues in the Christian life. Not Thanksgiving the holiday necessarily, but having a grateful heart. And from beginning to end, the scripture tells us, and the Bible talks about how we need to be a grateful people, a people filled with gratitude. In fact, it was the ungratitude of the people of God, the Israelites, when they were ungrateful for what God had done, that it caused their destruction and caused God to even pull their, his favor from them. And so, so having a heart of gratitude is so important. So I challenged you last week to join me on a 30-day challenge of gratitude. And I shared with you the Jesus prayer. If you weren't here, the Jesus prayer, I asked how many people in first service and second service. We had 450 people in church last week. And I asked, and there was only one other person or two other people that knew what the Jesus prayer was. Everybody knows the Lord's prayer, but nobody knows the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is a prayer that's been prayed since the beginning of the church by the Eastern Orthodox Church. And it's a way to give thanks to the Lord with every waking breath, conscious breath that we have. So the practice is that while you're consciously breathing, you say a prayer. Now, the prayer that the Eastern Orthodox mainly use, and there's some different variations of it, the one that they mainly use is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so I challenged you last week to change it up for this season of thanks. And here's the prayer that we put up. And so the idea is you breathe in as you're saying this first part, and you breathe out as you say the second part. And so you breathe in, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I commit my life to you with gratitude. Let's do it one more time. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I commit my life to you with gratitude. How many of you practiced that this week? Yeah. All right. Good number of you. A good number of you. The rest of you. I don't know if you're going to make it to heaven or not. Just kidding. But if you took me up on the practice, you know, Somewhere around day five, as I just began to do that, somewhere around day five, it was just so fascinating because I took a breath. I take a breath. My first waking breath in the morning, I take a breath, and all of a sudden, I was just, God was in my heart. God was in my mind, and I was thinking about him and praying for him, praying to him. So that was just one way to be thankful and grateful for the breath of life. This week, I want to take a few minutes and focus on the thanksgiving that we have in our hearts for our salvation. I want to focus on being thankful for our salvation. Gratitude is an attitude of celebration for what God has done. Gratitude is an attitude of celebration for what God has done. And just like the angels celebrate when one lost sinner comes to know the Lord... We should celebrate both our salvation and the salvation of others. And when Jesus shares the parable, there's a parable that Jesus shares about a woman finding the lost coin. He's talking about when, when one lost person is saved and comes to know the Lord. And he wraps up this parable in this way when he says, In the same way, when someone who is lost, who is outside of Jesus Christ, when some person is lost and they find God through Jesus, in the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. So, when you think about our salvation and when you think about the salvation of others, if we truly stop, if we truly stop and think about what that means, it's actually... It's almost mind-blowing for us to think about 
our salvation for eternity. It's beyond truly our level of comprehension for our finite mind with an infinite God. We can't even fathom what eternity really means. Now, I wanted to try this illustration here, if I could, with you. And um, so what I want to do here, well, let's just do it this way. What I'm going to do is I want to pass this back to you. Susie, I don't think that you'll get hurt if I throw this and you miss it and hit you. But let's just, I'm just going to try it, okay? So you ready to catch this? So here we go. Oh, oh good, good catch. Good catch, you guys. I'm going to pull it up this way just a little bit. Okay, that's good. Now, pass it on back. Maybe just kind of, you can throw it back there. Throw it to Justin. Uh, uh, go straight back. We're going to go straight back. See the guy in the blue shirt there? Throw it to him. Yeah, there you go. Oh, good job, good job, good job. You're like the Yankees there. That's a terrible catch. So now we're going to throw it on back to Joe. Throw it back to Joe. Joe Eisenhart there. There we go, Joe. All right. Oh, good, good job. And we're going to pull it tight here. This yellow. All right, we got to pull it tight. You get it, Joe? Did it go under the chair? That doesn't work out. Eternity doesn't go that way. Okay. So now, Joe, you just keep going with that. Go out the doors there. Go on. You're going to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, just keep going. Out the door. Yeah, out the door. Go on. East Venice. Go, go on to East Venice. Right. Okeechobee, West Palm. That's good. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. All right. We got this. Now. From here, can you guys see that? Everybody see that? From here to this white tape, all right? Just from, from here to this white tape. This is, this little section here that's six feet wide is the representing the thousands, millions, maybe billions if scientists are right, of b- before creation, of creation, okay? So this is, represents everything before our lives that's happened. Just this little short piece here. This little white piece of tape that you see is representing your life. This is representing your life in eternity. This is not a perfect illustration, of course, but everything beyond this. Now, this is going to represent what's the average age is like 80 years old, you know, and some of you are in overtime right now and (laughs) others of you are in first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, uh, probably in fourth quarter, you know. Uh, but wherever, and and so this represents, this little tiny little piece of tape here represents your life. And then eternity is represented all the way. And if, if Joe were to keep on going, and if somehow he could wrap this thing, get on a jet plane, and wrap this thing around the earth a million times, and then somehow, if, if Elon Musk could come up with some way to put this on a rocket ship and go around the entire universe a million times, even that wouldn't even come close to symbolizing one day of eternity. I mean, it's just, you, our minds just can't comprehend that. It, it just can't hardly comprehend it. And what we do with this brief blink of an eye moment of life represents what happens for the rest of eternity. And God has given us the opportunity to have a free gift of salvation for all eternity to spend that in heaven with him. It, it's, again, it's not a perfect illustration, but it just gives us some sort of a visual and a picture of what that means. Now, I didn't think this out very well, what to do with this rope uh, <laughs> now that we're done. But I, I suppose if your husband is asleep right now, Tying him up would be a lot of fun, you know. But that even doesn't give a full picture of eternity. And yet, and yet, we are promised for those that put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ that we have the promise of salvation and an eternity with God forever and ever. Now, for those people who are outside of the grace of Jesus Christ, because they haven't put their faith and trust in him. We, as Christians, should have a tremendously broken and troubled heart over people who are not saved because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross and given us the opportunity for this gift to be freely received for those who are still perishing. And it should give us a huge heart for sharing the love of Christ with everyone that we know and a huge urgency to share the love of Christ 
with everyone that we know. Now today, I want us to focus on the mindset, though, of being thankful for the salvation that we have received and for the salvation of others. And a constant theme that we see, constant theme that we see throughout the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote, Apostle Paul wrote letters to different churches that he started. He would start the church, then he would leave, and then he would stay in contact with them, and he would write letters of encouragement to them. And if they were doing some things that were wrong, he was saying, hey, guys, we need to get on the right track. And if they were doing a lot of things that were right, which they did that too, he would encourage them, but he really thanked them for his salvation, their salvation, and all of our salvation. Here's just one verse when Paul was writing the church in Colossae, and he says this. He says, giving joyful thanks... I'm giving joyful thanks to the Father, who's the Father, capital F, God, God the Father, giving joyful thanks to God the Father, who has qualified you, has qualified you, to share in the inheritance, we talked about adoption last week a little bit, that we were all adopted into the kingdom of God, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light, in whom we have redemption which is the forgiveness of sins. For he, God, has rescued us. You are a rescue. You're a rescue. I'm a rescue. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. And so when we look at this verse, there's a couple of things that really pop out to me that I want you to pay particular attention to, and that is this. One is... It is God, it is God and God alone who has qualified you. He's qualified us for salvation through the sacrifice of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And if you put your hope and if you put your trust and belief in Jesus, you're qualified to share in the inheritance of salvation. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians. God made him, talking about Jesus, God made him who had no sin, Jesus was perfect, he was sinless, he was blameless, and he was holy, he was righteous, God made him who had no sin to become sin, so he took on our sin. So all the things that you've done in your life that's been wrong, some of you, that's a lot, you know, all the things that you've, been do- that you've done that's wrong, all the things that I've done, everything that everybody on our planet, that's 8 billion people I just heard that we crossed the 8 billion mark this week, 8 billion people on our planet, and that's just right now in 2022, so everybody for the last 2,000 years before you, everybody in history's timeline, everybody... God made him who had no sin to take on the sins of the world and everybody that comes after us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And what that means is that Jesus was sinless, Jesus was blameless, and because Jesus was sinless, because Jesus was blameless, because Jesus was righteous and all those things. When God looks at you, even though you're a sinner and I'm a sinner, he looks at you through the lens It's like those viewfinders. He's looking at you through the lens of Jesus. And God is looking and it's filtering out Jesus' perfect life and taking on our sin. It filters out all of your sin and he sees you through the lens of Jesus. He sees you as holy. He sees you as blameless. So even all the sin that you've committed, if you've put your hope and trust in Jesus, Jesus filters that out. And God looks at you as holy. God looks at you as blameless. And then he says, for all of you who receive that free gift... This is in Romans. For all of you who receive that gift, you will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, because of this one man, Jesus Christ. And because of God's grace, because of what he has done on the cross, we get to participate in the inheritance of the saints of God. And because of that, you actually have a right. You have a right that's been given to you by God, and that is to share in all that God has for you. So you were qualified. You were qualified to receive the blessing of God by being made right with God. You don't have to do anything else to qualify. It's a gift. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you're qualified. He has qualified you. You are qualified to be completely forgiven. You are qualified to receive the Holy Spirit. You are qualified to receive peace and hope. You're qualified to have your prayers heard. And you are qualified to live with God in heaven for all eternity. You're qualified. But Mitch, you don't know me. You don't know what I've done. Here's the thing. Now, if you're an Olympic 
athlete and uh, you do something wrong, they're going to disqualify you. If you're a Christ follower and we sin, we're going to sin, right? All have fallen short of the glories of God. You're not disqualified because of our sin. Now, we should strive, right? Absolutely, we strive for obedience. We'll talk about that. We should strive to become more like Jesus. But you're not disqualified because of something that you've done wrong. You're qualified because of what Jesus has already done for you. And then you say, well, Mitch, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I believe that. It doesn't seem to work for me. Well, you're partly right that if you don't have faith in Christ, it, it won't happen for you. Because all the blessings of God are appropriated or ushered in or, or activated, might be a better word, by your faith. All the blessings of God are activated by your faith. That means that you must believe what God says before you're going to see the promised blessings happen in your life. Here's, here's a scripture from Romans that talks about this. Through him, Paul says, talking about Jesus, through him, through whom, sorry, through whom, which is Jesus, we have gained access. We have gained access by our faith. We've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So God has provided everything for us by his grace. Nothing you can do. You can't say enough prayers. You can't work in the children's ministry enough, although I think that gets you extra credit. You can't do, there's nothing you can personally do to earn your way to heaven. It is what Jesus has already done, and he's qualified you purely undeserved by us, but it's a free gift nonetheless, and we have access to it by faith. So that makes you qualified. Hey, can you say this with me? God made me qualified. God made made me qualified. Now, think about salvation. Think about eternity. Think about being with God and having life everlasting with God. And let's say that like we've been saved, man. All right, you ready? Here we go. God made me qualified. Yeah, much, 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 much more better. Much more better. Because of that fact, and that fact alone, we should be thankful for the gift of God. Now, here's the thing. There are Two ordinances, there are two ordinances that have been given to us and been given to the church to help remind us of the death and the sacrifices uh, and, 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 and salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. Two ordinances. What's an ordinance? An ordinance is simply a command from God. An ordinance is a command, and God has actually commanded us to celebrate our salvation, to be thankful for, to remember our salvation. Now, inside of these two ordinances are two sacraments, you know, two sacraments that God has given us to help us remember our and celebrate our salvation. An ordinance and a sacrament, those of you, especially those of you who are Catholics, you, you're familiar with that term. An ordinance and a sacrament are very, very synonymous. They are almost the same thing, but there are two sacraments of the church that Jesus gave to us as symbolic reminders to be thankful for our salvation as this great rescue of God for his people. The two sacraments are baptism and communion. Those are the two sacraments. Now, if you grew up in the Catholic church, you were taught that there are seven sacraments of the church. You were taught that there was baptism, communion, Eucharist. You were taught about confirmation, ordination, confession, anointing, and marriage. Those are the five other sacraments that if you were, grew up in the Catholic Church, you would have learned those things. And we certainly practice those things, maybe some, in some ways a little bit different, but we practice those things as well. We certainly practice confession. We should all confess our sins before the Lord and confess our sins to each other. That's biblical. Uh, we do that. You should do that. We talk about ordination. Ordination is setting apart those who are called for the works of the Lord. We certainly do that with elders, pastors. We do that for key leaders and things in the church and deacons. We don't call them that here, but server, servants. Uh, what was the other one? Con confirmation. You're qualified. That's what we've been talking about. It's, it's the qualifying. Uh, that's because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
The other was anointing. What is the anointing part? It's when the Bible says, if any of you are sick, you should call the elders of the church, ask those who have been ordained, or those who are leaders, to anoint you with oil, pray over the sick. We do that. We practice that. We think that's very important. And then the holy covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. We think that's important. But these two, these two sacraments of baptism and communion are the two ordinances and the two sacraments that have been given to us as a church to really focus on being thankful for and remembering the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. So let's look at these two real quick. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of hit this briefly. This is not a message necessarily on baptism or communion, but I just want to kind of hit a couple of these. In terms of baptism, this is what baptism does. When you're baptized, Paul says, when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we actually participated in and we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, God, now we also live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we're also going to be raised to life as he was. So, how does baptism then join him in his death? Well, there's two ways. There's probably more than that, but there's at least two ways. The first is we're dying to our old selves. When we give our life to Christ and we commit to baptism... We are dying to our old selves. The old self disappears. Now, it doesn't, all of a sudden, you don't just become, you, you, all your sin is, is, is ne you never sin again. It's a process. But you begin the process of living obediently, and you're hopeful that the old remnant of your life before you made your commitment to Christ is beginning to disappear. And you're becoming a new creation in Christ. And when you give your life to Christ, you should be growing in your obedience to him and his word and trying to obey to be more like him and to become like him. Jesus would interact with his relationships with people and how Jesus would interact in his relationship with the Father. That's our goal. This is actually called, it's a big church word, it's called sanctification. If you've heard that word before, sanctification, we boil it down to this. Sanctification is simply this. It is in our lives, we commit our life to Christ, and then we begin to, begin to emulate Christ in our lives. And it's the process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus in the way that he acts towards people and the way that he acts towards God. That's sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. I had a fishing buddy. Uh, my daughter will know this in the back, back there. She's sitting in the back row in case she needed to run out quick uh, from something that I said maybe. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, I have a friend named Joe, and Joe and I have been fishing buddies for a long time. And uh, we used to, I used to fish. I'm just going to do a little uh, bragging here. Um, I used to fish in the pro tour tournament for the Redfish Pro Tour. Um, not that I was that great of a fisherman, but I was better than Joe, and he's the one that signed up for the fishing tournament. Anyway, so I fished in the, in the, in the pro tour for a little while. But we go fishing. We spend a lot of time together, and we go fishing, and we'd be driving somewhere. And it was always funny to me because if somebody pulled out in front of him or somebody said something disparaging to him, he would always say, you know, the old Joe would have done this. <laughs> the old Joe would have said this, you know. <laughs> I never saw the old Joe, but I mean, like, the old Joe would have done this. And he goes, but the new Joe, I'm biting my tongue right now, or I'm, you know. And so that's kind of the way it is, you know. The old Joe, the old Joe. It was like, this. yeah, right? <laughs> That's right. The old Joe. It's becoming more like Jesus. The old you dies. The new you raises up. The second part of the baptism section, the second part is that when we go under the water, it's symbolic that we are dying to our old selves. And that's why, we, that's why baptism was practiced by immersion from the very beginning, in the first century, and that's why we practice baptism by immersion, because when we go underwater for that brief moment, it's like you are dying to yourself, and the very word baptize actually means to immerse, or to plunge, or to dip, or to wash. It actually didn't become a religious term until much, much later. It, it comes from the Greek word baptizo, 
And baptizo was a very common word used in the Greek language. It was just so common. It was not a religious thing. You know, when we hear baptized now, we think immediately of this ceremonial thing. But that's not what baptized meant when it, when it was first introduced in the Greek language, when they first used it. It was just a common word. In fact, if your wife wanted you to wash the dishes, she might say, I need you, honey, to go baptize the dishes tonight, you know. Or if you had a ship that went down and people were lost at sea, they say, oh, they died. Their ship was baptized, you know. And it was just a common word. In fact, archaeologists found an old Greek dill pickle recipe. And it was kind of interesting. As you read this old dill pickle recipe, it had all the things that you had to put in the ingredients. And you put the dill and I guess the vinegar or whatever it else is. And then it said when you get down to the end, it says, now baptize your cucumbers, you know. And so it was a very common word, but it meant to immerse, and to, that's why we immerse even today. Because for that brief moment that we're underwater, it is symbolic that there's no breath, that we've died to the old self. Now, for some of you, when we baptize you, we hold you down for quite a bit longer, depending. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Except for Bob Spadaro. We, we had to get a snorkel for him when we baptized him. <laughs> but it's symbolic. It's symbolic that we're dying to our old self. That brief moment that we're underwater, when we come up, we're raised anew in Christ Jesus. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail on baptism. But it was an act that is commanded by God for us to do. And in almost, almost every occurrence in the Bible, baptism follows a person making a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. But I want to say this, and I want to make this clear, because there's been some confusion over this in the years in some churches. Baptism is not what saves us. We're not saved by baptism. The Bible is very clear about that. It is absolutely commanded, and we should be baptized, but that's not what saves us. It's very clear that that, that we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and his grace only. And, and it's, baptism is an act of obedience that symbolizes our life in Christ. And we are only saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. I won't talk too much more about baptism, but I wanted to let you know that uh, it is very important to us and that we want to baptize people. And December the 11th, coming up, what is that, like three weeks away, I think? And December the 11th, we're going to have, after church here, we're going to have a big picnic, you know, we have a big picnic. And we're going to try something new because of our attendance and, and the parking and, and stuff. We're going to try something new, and it'll work out really good for that day. We're going to kind of direct you around the building this way instead of going through this way to make it a little safer. And we're going to put a tent right outside here in the front. And, and then we bought a new baptistry, and it's awesome. It's a heated baptistry. It's very dignifying, and, and we're going to roll that thing out, and, and we'll be able to do baptisms here at the church as well. Some of you, you know, we do the annual beach baptisms, but sometimes people don't, they get weirded out by that, and so this is going to be for, for, you know, another option for us to be baptized. We're going to be right out here, and then following the baptisms, the scripture says that we should have hamburgers and hot dogs to celebrate, <laughs> and so we're going to have a big picnic Afterwards, it's going to be fun. We, if, you, if you are someone who's never been baptized before, you want to be baptized, you want to commit your life to Christ, or maybe you were sprinkled as a baby, or maybe you, haven't, maybe you don't remember it, whatever, uh, you know, we're going to have a time after this service today for about 15 minutes. Pastor Mike has made himself available, and, and about, for about 15 minutes after this, he's going to answer any questions that you have about baptism. And if you would like to be baptized, I would just encourage you to, to meet with him. You, as you're going out the door here in the center, right to your left is the next steps room. You just pop in there into that room, and, and then Mike will take you back into my office area, and, and we're going to talk about baptism. Just take about 15 minutes, but he'll go into a lot more detail that we just don't have time for this morning. Now, the second ordinance, so baptism is the first ordinance. The second ordinance, or sacrament, that Jesus gave to the church was communion. Now, baptism through immersion is a one-time act, typically. Typically, it's a one-time act, although it's perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly acceptable for you to be baptized again if you were baptized so young that you don't remember or if maybe you've gone years and years and years away from Christ and you feel like you need to be baptized again. There's absolutely... That, that's, that's totally acceptable. You're fine with that. 
For instance, I was sprinkled as a baby, but then later, when I was able to make that decision on my own, and my parents did a great job, nothing that doesn't take away anything at all from the commitment that they made to me in raising me up in the ways of the Lord when I was sprinkled and dedicated as a baby. Um, but there is actually no scriptural reference anywhere to be found in the Bible, not, one, not, not even one occurrence in the Bible where a baby was baptized. For that reason, we don't baptize babies at First Christian, but we do have them dedicated to the Lord. But we wait until a person can, of their own accord, make a confession of faith and understand what Jesus has done for them on the cross. And then they participate in his death and his burial and his resurrection. Anyway, if you have questions about that, a short class afterwards. But we don't have to be baptized. This is what I want to get to on this. You don't have to be baptized every time you sin. Heck, if that was the case, <laughs> we're going to need a bigger pool, right? I mean, I have to be baptized every single day. And I'm thinking, I know some of you, you have to too. But communion, communion is a way for us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus and be thankful for our salvation on a daily basis, on a very regular basis. In fact, Jesus says, as oft as you eat of this bread, as oft as you take of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. It's actually not even just a Sunday morning thing. It's a daily thing. It's a daily communion with God thing. Now, we, we do communion once a week here as a body because it's greatly, it's greatly symbolic in what the first century church did. But I think one of the reasons why Jesus chose something as common as bread and wine to remember the sacrifice is because that's the life sustenance that we need every single day for life, Right? I mean, we need that sustenance every single day for life. And Jesus was establishing something that's common that we do every single day to help us remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. And then he's going to share this about how we go about doing that with the church in Corinth. Now, the church in Corinth, how much time do I have? I don't have enough time to tell you about that church. But the church in Corinth, they were, they were pistols, I'm telling you. They were like... They were really handling communion wrong. They were drinking in an unworthy manner. They were bickering. They were disunified as a church. They were sinning uh, like crazy. They, in fact, their communion had become a gluttonous thing where people were just eating all the bread and all the, you know, and they, and they were getting drunk in the services. They were getting drunk as a church, you know, if you can imagine that. And we've taken all of the temptation out. <laughs> You can't, you could drink all of these that you wanted right now. Nothing like that. But they were doing all this. And Paul, Paul lays all this out. This is fantastic for you to read this in Corinthians chapter 11. He lays all this out for the church. And then he shares, you know, the reason why we do this. He says, for I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself, Paul says. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement that was confirmed and you are qualified by my blood. Paul says, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Now, those are the two reminders for us to be thankful for our salvation. This morning, before we take it, and you may have already taken it, that's fine. <laughs> Just pretend like you haven't taken it yet. And <laughs> this morning, I thought it'd be good for us to just close out the message portion by remembering the sacrifice of Jesus together. So if you're watching online, uh, you want to participate with us, go ahead and grab something to drink and, and a bread to eat. I want to say this too, that this is open. You know, this is some kind of confusing in some churches. Am I allowed to take communion? Am I not allowed to take communion? What's, what's the rule on that? 
If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've put your hope and trust in him, please join us for communion. You're absolutely welcome. It is a time for believers. It is a time for believers to recognize the sacrifice of what Jesus has done for us. It's a holy time. It's a sacred time. If you're not sure where you're at in your faith right now, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm really so pleased that you're here this morning, and we want to help you grow in your faith. But you might not have the full meaning of what we're about to do and what some of you have already done. And so, <laughs> and so what, what I would just say to you is it, use this time, though. Use this time to just reflect on what you believe. And if God is tugging on your heart right now to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, Use this time to really reflect on that. And for those of us who have put our hope and trust in Jesus, I just would ask you to bow your head. And seriously, if you've already taken it, just, just focus on this. Just focus on the fact and thanking God and pray right now. Thanking him for your salvation. Thank him for the what he has endured on the cross and the agony that he endured by taking on your sin that gives you the hope for all eternity. Thank him for that. Maybe it'd be a good time also to pray for those people in your life that you know have not trusted in Jesus yet. Pray for their salvation. Pray that God would open up a door for you or an avenue for you to have an opportunity to share. Pray that you would have the strength and the courage to share your faith with them. Pray that they would come to know the Lord. In Thanksgiving, let's thank God for his body by taking the bread. And the juice that represents his blood. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, you and you alone are qualified to forgive us of our sins. You and you alone are the king of our hearts. And Lord, may we never forget the sacrifice that you made for our lives. May we never forget the agony that you felt when you had no sin in your life. And yet you took on our sins. You defeated death and paved the way for us. Lord, that we might mourn for you, that we might mourn for what you've done at the same time celebrating what you've done for us, God. That you've paved the way for us to live life eternally with you. And God, we want to commit our lives to you, to live in obedience to you and your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.